Socialism used to be a really scary word in the United States. It helped fuel the Red Scare when Congress carried out massive witch hunts to weed out suspected American communists and traitors after each world war. Our job as Americans and as Republicans is to dislodge the traitors from every place where they have been sent to do their traitorous work. Until recently, though, socialism had been relegated to the sidelines of American politics, and it's taken on more of a positive connotation thanks in large part to Bernie Sanders from Vermont. When I talk about democratic socialism, I am talking about Medicare. When I talk about democratic socialism, I'm not looking at Venezuela. I'm not looking at Cuba. I'm looking at countries like Denmark and Sweden. The 2016 presidential contender was a self-proclaimed democratic socialist who tapped into a huge and angry voting bloc of the country's disillusioned youth. Financing college for all students in America really resonates with me. Workers' rights. Climate change. He's planting the seed. Closing the wage gap. He cares about um, black students on this campus. This is a movement that's going to exist for many, many years to come. Sanders made socialism cool. He also paved the way for the rise of other charismatic politicians like him. House Representative Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez had volunteered on the Sanders campaign before deciding to run for Congress herself. She was an overnight sensation after her unprecedented victory in 2018. Despite the fact that we were running against a 10-term incumbent, despite the fact that we didn't have the money, despite the fact that I'm working class, despite all those things, we won. AOC fervor has swept the country. We are in a moment where socialism is no longer a dirty word um, because people are affiliating it with those candidates who are already incredibly popular. But this swell of popularity has also triggered new fervor against socialism. Democrat lawmakers are now embracing socialism. They want to replace individual rights with total government domination. So is this political zeitgeist that's upsetting the status quo a fad or the future of politics in America? Tell me what democracy looks like. This is what democracy looks like. To understand democratic socialism in America, it's best to start with the basics. Capitalism, socialism, and communism exist along a sort of economic spectrum. At one end, the government has total control over the economy, and at the other, little to none. Socialism is somewhere in between the two. It's a system where the government has nationalized most all major industries, but unlike communism, property and resources aren't owned and controlled by the state. Instead, the government redistributes the wealth to individuals in a way it deems fair and equitable. Democratic socialism lies somewhere between socialism and capitalism, depending on whom you talk to. For some, this system is pro-market. Others want to abolish capitalism entirely, but they do agree on more government control, ensuring things like universal health care and tuition-free college funded through expanded taxes on corporations and the rich. Much like the kind of system that you see in Scandinavia or Iceland. Sounds like socialism to me. <laughs> Democratic socialism. Uh, what's the difference? Huge difference. But to understand why the debate over socialism in the U.S. is so heated, you need to know a little history, too. Here's a crash course. Even before German radicals Karl Marx and Friedrich Engels released the Communist Manifesto in 1848, the ideals of socialism had already taken root in the United States. After Thomas Paine's famous writings helped drive patriots to war with the British, he soon took on a new cause, taxing wealthy landowners to help pay for a basic income for all citizens. Sound familiar? He didn't call it socialism, but it checked a lot of the boxes. Over the 19th century, these socialist principles incubated in labor unions, and later flourished during the Industrial Revolution, when wealth was suddenly highly concentrated among an elite few in this gilded age. Capitalism became a common enemy for a population that felt left behind. In 1901, a few pro-socialist groups banded together to form the Socialist Party of America. Within a decade, socialist candidates began winning multiple local, state, and national-level elections. By 1912, the party even ran a competitive candidate for president. But then came the First World War, the overthrow of imperialist Russia, and the rise of an oppressive communist Soviet Union. 
the U.S. government cracked down on perceived disloyalty at home in what became known as the First Red Scare. There had been nationwide raids, and the public seemed glad to have any type of radical brought to trial. American socialism continued to decline in the 1920s. And in the aftermath of the Great Depression, President FDR's New Deal of the 1930s, which promoted huge public works projects and programs like Social Security, only further served to steal the party's thunder. A rolling ball of economic recovery gathers thousands of men and women every week. With the end of World War II and the fall of Nazi Germany leaving a huge power vacuum in Western Europe, the democratic U.S. and its Western allies began a global, multi-decade battle against the communist USSR and its satellite states. Being a socialist was suddenly as good as being a communist, which was synonymous with being an enemy of the state. Republican Senator Joe McCarthy led the infamous Second Red Scare of the 1950s. The man assigned this communist pledge to pledge to support the Communist Party. It was a brutal and public witch hunt designed to identify anyone from communist sympathizers to secret Soviet agents. No one was free from scrutiny, not school teachers, artists, or journalists. Have you no sense of decency, sir? Let us not assassinate this lad further, Senator. Okay, well, let's, let's you have done enough. Then the pendulum swung the other way. The 1960s saw the start of a multi-decade surge in left-wing politics. From the counterculture to civil rights and the anti-war movement, liberal politics became mainstream. But even with this resurgence of liberal ideas, socialism had faded to the background. Fast forward to 1989. Uh, and we have a remarkable development here tonight at the Brandenburg Gate. On the other side, East Germans have now come to the wall and many of them have been seen crawling up on the wall, being helped across by West Germans from this side. Down came the Berlin Wall, and with it, the end of the Cold War. The atrocities of autocratic communist states were on the world stage, and for a couple decades, the U.S. was happy to promote the win for democracy and capitalism, while socialism largely slipped out of the lexicon. But then came the 2008 financial crisis. Lehman here is going bankrupt. Some of the biggest names in American business are tonight gone, along with a lot of money and a lot of jobs. As millennials came into adulthood, the formative images seared into their minds weren't of the fall of the Berlin Wall, but of a financial meltdown. The foreclosure rate in this area right now is over 400 percent. It's a war out there. I mean, these people are losing homes every single day. You got people sleeping on the street, sleeping on bus shelters. Is that where I'm going to end up? Stories like these pushed the country to a breaking point. Public outrage poured into the streets. We Occupy movements across the country demonized capitalism, blaming it for the country's widespread economic inequality. We have sold out, French got out. Burdened by student debt and a tough job market, for many millennials, it seemed the free market wasn't working. Many wanted radical reform, but it wasn't until Bernie Sanders ran for president that they found a bigger name for their cause. America's socialist movement was reborn. Sanders had effectively tapped into a fresh crop of socialists, even though his platform wasn't offering anything particularly different to what he had already been talking about for decades. In our society, theoretically a democratic society, you have a handful of people who control our economy. You have uh, maybe 2% of the population that owns one-third of the entire wealth of America, 80% of the stocks, 90% of the bonds. And these people have incredible power. Nearly 40 years later, Sanders' vision of a socialist America has finally gone mainstream. Bhaskar Sumkara was one of the early adopters. When he launched the magazine Jacobin in 2010, it was, in theory, a pretty bad idea. Not only was print dying, Bhaskar's niche quarterly was going to target America's socialists before the country had actually started talking or caring about socialism again. But the 21-year-old college student followed his gut, and the gamble paid off. Jacobin struck a nerve, and its circulation took off. Socialism in the U.S. has been a marginal force for many decades, so I think we're kind of inventing things from scratch now. A 2018 Gallup poll showed the Democrats have a way more positive image of socialism than they do of capitalism. If you look at Fortune 500 CEOs, these people have tremendous say over your lives, over what you consume, over how you work, over the future of our country. And they're subject to no democratic mandate. They're accountable to, to no one but their shareholders. And there's one group working to change that on the ground. 
The Democratic Socialists of America bills itself as the largest socialist organization in the country. It has its own firebrand version of socialism, with some members who want to abolish the Senate and get rid of capitalism. It's been around since 1982, but it went from the fringe to the mainstream in 2015. DSA membership is up nearly tenfold since Bernie Sanders came onto the scene, and its politicians are winning races across the country at every level of government. The DSA has a huge presence in New York. Every borough has its own branch, and Brooklyn has three. We headed to one of their local meetups in Queens to see what they're really like when they meet behind closed doors, and to get a feel for what socialist policy actually looks like at the grassroots level. Jackson Heights is one of the most diverse neighborhoods in America. It's also part of New York's 14th Congressional District, which is currently represented by AOC. AOC is a card-holding member, as is the politician you see here, New York State Senator Julia Salazar. The two women have a few big things in common. Salazar is 28 years old, a graduate of a top university, and a fresh face in American politics. As democratic socialists, we are acutely aware of the racial bias that is endemic in our criminal legal system. We're acutely aware of how that racial bias intersects with the criminalization of poverty. During our visit, Salazar was talking about criminal justice reform to help drum up support for fellow DSA member Tiffany Caban, a public defender running for Queens District Attorney. Let's go knock some doors and make some change happen. We had the chance to canvas with some of Caban's supporters, like Ryan Bruckenthal, a New York teacher and veteran activist. Our ideal version of America is one where every human being is given the things that they need to survive and thrive. Um, a place where people don't have to go bankrupt from having hospital bills, making sure that good paying union jobs are provided for those who are looking for them, making sure that we have a new economy that is sustainable and can continue life on earth as we know it. The DA race is one of many political battles being waged by democratic socialists intent on carving out a place for the DSA in mainstream American politics. Hi everyone, welcome. This is the Lower Manhattan uh, branch of the DSA. At another meetup of the DSA, this time across town in Manhattan's East Village, another chapter was planning its own offensive. This one centered on ensuring housing as a basic human right through an ambitious universal rent control campaign. So the universal rent control platform is a series of nine bills. And although they are not sort of like utopian socialism, they are by far the strongest um, offensive use of the law to protect renters that we've had virtually ever. Some in the room feared media exposure of their meeting could hurt the movement. One person raised a motion at the start of the meeting requesting that we leave. And we were ultimately asked to turn the cameras off for their strategy session, which goes to show just how sensitive this issue still is politically. But as the democratic socialist movement gains momentum and even real positions of power in the United States, some worry socialism in any form is a slippery slope. Let's by all means have an argument about whether the United States should have a more progressive uh, tax policy. Let's by all means have an argument about whether the really broken system of healthcare in the United States, which is both the most expensive and the least efficient in the world, could be reformed. But let's not dignify socialism, because before you know it, you'll be letting real socialism in by the back door. And that's, that's just a disaster waiting to happen. Some point to authoritarian leaders who promised the virtues of socialism, but led their people down a path of economic despair and limited freedoms. Now, critics of socialism will point to examples like Venezuela and the USSR, where it hasn't played out well. What do you say to those critics? This speaks partly to the distinction between democratic socialism and socialism more broadly, that under democratic socialism, it's led by the people. There is accountability at every level. Socialist governments throughout history, some of their problems have really been due to a lack of democracy and a socialism that really is driven by the grassroots and by the people. The socialism being promulgated by the DSA has somewhat lost the stigma, partly because it's dropped its Soviet context. It's also less controversial since modern-day America is already deeply rooted in policies once deemed socialist, from five-day work weeks to universal public education, Medicare, Social Security, and public welfare programs. But perhaps most importantly, some say socialism isn't as taboo as it used to be because people don't really care what you call it so long as it results in a more equitable society. Nobel Prize winning economist Joseph Stiglitz says the policies tend to speak for themselves. When 
AOC or Bernie Sanders lists the things that they're concerned about. Everybody having health insurance and education to live up to their opportunity, a decent retirement, access to a good mortgage or decent housing, access to a decent job. You ask people, do they want that? And the answer is yes. The response among young people, if you call that socialist, we're socialist. If you call that progressive capitalist, we're progressive capitalists. You know, whatever you name it, that's what we want. And so I think we shouldn't get hung up over these particular words. In practical terms, politicians like Bernie Sanders and AOC have a pretty ambitious wish list. Universal health care in the form of Medicare for all, a federal jobs guarantee and a higher minimum wage, mass unionization of the workforce, plus stronger protection for those unions, tuition for university, some form of a universal basic income, the dissolution of ICE, just to name a few. Other, more controversial and contested measures like abolishing the prison system have also made it onto the legislative agendas of some Democratic Socialists. Freshman Congresswoman AOC has already begun to aggressively push her socialist agenda on Capitol Hill. Just take the Green New Deal, designed to put a stop to the country's dependence on carbon-based energy. We are facing a national crisis, and if we do not ascend to that crisis, if we tell the American public that we are more willing to invest and bail out big banks than we are willing to invest in our farmers and our urban families, then I don't know what we're here doing. While details for the so-called Green New Deal are sparse, several of the 2020 presidential hopefuls are throwing their weight behind the plan. Then there's Sanders' Medicare for All bill that he formally introduced in 2017 after stumping for it in the 2016 election. I am just very excited about the kind of support our Medicare for All legislation is receiving all across this country and right here in the United States Senate. Bernie's single-payer national health insurance plan has garnered support from many Democrats vying for the party's bid in 2020. AOC and Sanders also back housing as a fundamental right, which is still a pretty radical concept in the U.S. Policy ideas like these may be popular, but there's always that one big question. How do you pay for it? Ten-year estimates from nonpartisan and left-leaning groups show that these proposals could add up to a price tag of more than $42 trillion. And this number does not factor in the expected $11.4 trillion deficit over the next 10 years that's already anticipated under current law. It also doesn't include the Green New Deal, which Republican critics say could cost tens of trillions of dollars. The plans proposed by Senator Sanders and AOC are not remotely affordable in the United States. Any one of them might look affordable in the abstract, but when you put them together, they add up. You're well over $42 trillion over 10 years. Uh, that would basically double the size of the federal government. If you're going to get socialism in America, you need substantially higher taxes, and not just on the rich, but on everybody else. Uh, if you go to Sweden or Norway or Finland, you'll realize that it's not just the rich paying 50, 60% taxes, it's the middle class. AOC has put forward one plan to cover part of that $42 trillion bill. She wants to raise the federal tax rate on incomes over $10 million to 70%. To put that into perspective, Sanders' 2016 presidential platform capped the top tax rate at 54.2%. Assuming no tax planning, AOC's proposal would bring in $700 billion over 10 years. Medicare for All is estimated to be the single biggest expense on the agenda, but it's also one of the policies that Democratic Socialists say will actually make money in the end. Well, some of the measures, let's say for health insurance, in fact, I believe there'll be a net savings if you cut out some of the private insurance bureaucracies and some of the waste and mismanagement in our current, current system. So I think Medicare for All, for example, would pay for itself and then some. But critics argue the math doesn't work out for a couple different reasons. That's not true at all. First, what Senator Sanders is proposing is extraordinarily larger than anything the private sector does, and it's actually more generous than what other countries do. You could basically get any medical procedure you want, anytime, with no deductibles, no co-pays, full long-term care for seniors. Nobody does that. Because nobody's figured out how to really create a tax that converts every dollar of private healthcare spending that doesn't bankrupt families and small businesses. 
one major structural shift being proposed, totally erasing student debt. The College for All Act from Bernie Sanders would erase the student debt of 45 million Americans. He'd pay for that $1.6 trillion expense with a new tax on Wall Street transactions. But democratic socialism isn't just about advocating for these kinds of expansions of the social safety net. The movement is also pushing to give workers more power over corporations. Sanders wants to create more public ownership over corporate boards. Under the plan, corporations would have to do two big things. One, give workers a certain number of seats on its board of directors. And two, contribute stock to an employee-led fund that would pay out regular dividends to the company's workers. Democratic socialists also want to take on banks. In May 2019, Sanders and AOC called banks modern-day loan sharks and proposed a dramatic cut to credit card interest rates. No bank in this country uh, should have credit card interest rates of over 15%. We talk about payday lending, and in New York, we worked very hard to outlaw payday lending. But what happens when everyday banks start to charge higher and higher interest rates? Essentially, your credit card becomes a payday loan. They're also pitching legislation to cap rates on consumer loans. The American Bankers Association argues this plan would ultimately hurt the consumer by restricting their access to credit. But on the whole, policy ideas like these are receiving a lot of positive feedback. Amazon HQ2, on the other hand, wasn't as clear-cut a case. Breaking news, Amazon canceling its controversial plans. Now it will not build a headquarters in New York. The world's biggest company just got sent packing thanks to an unfriendly welcome by New Yorkers. In February 2019, the company ditched its plan to build one of its two new headquarters in Queens. The governor and mayor had both backed the deal, as had a majority of New York City's registered voters, according to a Quinnipiac University poll. But there was one very notable figure who was against the plan. Organizers and, and residents of my community were busting down our doors saying, you need to say something mm -hmm. about this. AOC, State Senator Julia Salazar and the DSA, along with a coalition of unions and local left-leaning groups, opposed the $3 billion in state and city tax breaks that Amazon would have received. As AOC celebrated Amazon's decision to pull out of New York. I mean, it shows that everyday Americans can have more say in this country than the richest man in the world. Others question whether it was a good thing to bid farewell to the promise of 25 to 40,000 new jobs and about $27 billion in new tax revenue to the city and state. You know, she basically is taking the victory lap while thousands of people lost the American dream opportunity. AOC, on the other hand, saw the pullout as a crucial step in securing a better economy for New Yorkers in the long run. We say it's not just about any job. We need to create dignified jobs. Jobs that are part of a moral economy. And it wasn't just the job quality that drove socialist opposition to Amazon's New York HQ2. Many socialists also argue that the fact that Amazon was set to take in billions in subsidies in the first place shows that in some ways we already live in a socialist economy, but a deeply flawed one, where it's the corporations that get the benefit, not the workers. But even as the policy ideas of AOC and Sanders gain momentum, a lingering question remains. Will that popularity actually count for something when people go to vote? Or could the growing divide in the Democratic Party actually cost them the White House in 2020? President Trump has already begun to capitalize on this ideological rift by weaponizing the word socialism. America will never be a socialist country. But the Democratic Socialists we spoke with think this kind of Red Scare language isn't driving away their voters. They feel their platform resonates not only with more progressive coastal cities, but also with the traditionally hard-to-crack Midwest. I think that the Democratic Socialist candidate actually would have wider appeal in the heartland than they do in wealthy cities on the East Coast. In fact, there's a segment of the Democratic base, uh, real estate developers, trial lawyers, and Silicon Valley tech types that would absolutely abhor a Democratic Socialist candidate like Bernie Sanders. Halsey Hazard is a recent NYU grad, a member of the DSA, and originally hails from Wisconsin. Um, both of my parents are Republicans, you know, my dad's ex-military. Do you think that New York's version of being a democratic socialist can thrive in the Midwest? I mean, when you look at the fact that like Bernie won 71 out of 72 counties in Wisconsin in the 2016 primary, I think that shows that his sort of politics really resonate with a lot of people in the Midwest, for sure. Part of what's driving socialism's newfound popularity are the same factors that led to President Trump's rise to power. Trump's no socialist, but he won the presidency by promising to shake up the system from within, including by challenging notions of free trade and other capitalist priorities. 
So whether you ascribe to democratic socialism or not, there does appear to be consensus on one big point about American politics today. The free market system in the U.S., as it is now, needs work. Free market titans like Ray Dalio, the billionaire founder of hedge fund Bridgewater Associates, agree that serious change is needed because the current system under capitalism isn't working anymore. Dalio shared his thoughts on LinkedIn in a 7,500-word essay on the subject. He followed up with an April 2019 appearance on 60 Minutes, where he commented on the dire state of the American dream. I think the American dream is lost. I think uh, it's not redistributing opportunity. We can call it a wealth gap. You can call it an income gap. It's a huge issue. Joseph Stiglitz also thinks that a lot of what's fomenting unrest among American voters traces back to free market policies. A lot of the concerns today are generated because the market hasn't solved these problems. Redefining and fixing America's free market policies seems to be rooted, at least in part, in semantics. 20th century labels just don't fit 21st century problems. Here is an economic transition that needs technology, that will create new jobs, that moves our economy also to hopefully a cleaner and healthier economy. And yet we seem to be debating that imperative of change in terms of last century's opposites of capitalism and socialism. It doesn't make sense. So, is socialism in the U.S. a genuine and lasting swing left of American voters fed up with the free market? Or is it just a fad, the coolest new catch-all for disillusioned people trying to make a stand? Only time will tell. I find it kind of shocking and depressing that the word socialism has crept back uh, into some kind of vogue. I really do believe that we should be structuring the economy towards human need and not towards accumulating profit. This is horribly mistaken, but socialism is always popular among young people, uh, perhaps more so now. It wouldn't solve all of the world's problems, but a socialist society is one in which people are more empowered um, to have control over their destiny.